tonight. Why small steps on gun control are so hard. Managing hate on campus. Not to say we're not doing anything, but we got to do better. And fashion's pollution faux pas. The Supreme Court ruled today that immigrants who've been detained are not entitled to regular bail hearings under immigration law. The 5-3 to three decision encompasses lawful immigrants and asylum seekers who are in custody while the government determines whether they can remain in the U.S. But the justices also sent the case back to a lower court to decide whether or not the law is constitutional in the first place. The case stems from a lawsuit brought by the ACLU, which argues that without regularly scheduled bond hearings, immigrants face the risk of being locked up indefinitely. A magnitude 7.5 earthquake in a remote part of Papua New Guinea set off landslides and caused buildings to collapse, killing more than a dozen people, according to Reuters. Officials say it could take days to confirm the total number of people killed, and the damage to phone lines and roads is slowing relief efforts. ExxonMobil shut down a liquefied natural gas plant that it operates in the region and evacuated non-essential employees. The White House has downgraded Jared Kushner's security clearance, meaning he won't have access to all the highly classified information he's been accustomed to. Kushner, the president's son-in-law and senior advisor, is the most prominent staffer to have his clearance changed under new policies announced after the Rob Porter scandal. According to Politico, which first broke the story, White House aides with interim high-level clearances were told on Friday that those clearances were being bumped down to secret, the most basic level on the scale. President Trump officially jumped into the 2020 race today and named Brad Parscale as his campaign manager. Parscale served as the Trump campaign's digital director during the 2016 election. He's an eyebrow-raising pick because his portfolio put him so close to the Russian meddling operation being waged on the same platforms. Parscale has said he was, quote, unaware of any Russian involvement in the Trump campaign's operations. The House Intelligence Committee interviewed him as part of its investigation, but the session was behind closed doors. Officials in other states are trying to woo Delta away from its Georgia headquarters after Republicans there threatened to tear up a tax deal because the airline distanced itself from the NRA. Virginia's governor and New York's lieutenant governor both tweeted at the company, which is one of Georgia's biggest employers, saying their states were open for business. Over the weekend, Delta said it would end a contract giving discounted rates to NRA members. Georgia's lieutenant governor responded that unless the company changed its position, he would kill any tax legislation it benefits from. More than 15 companies have cut relationships with the NRA in the wake of the Parkland shooting. The House and Senate were back at work today, and everyone rushed to address the guns issue mostly by talking past each other. We'll find out what the Senate can do, and then we'll, we'll address that then. There are <clears throat> bipartisan differences. We Democrats intend to push our Republican colleagues to have a real debate on gun safety. There's actually no shortage of concrete ideas, or factions pushing for them. But none has amassed a big enough majority to succeed. And that means, for now, there's no clear path forward. Even in this hyper-polarized environment of Capitol Hill in 2018, there are gun policies that have some degree of bipartisan support. The reason they never seem to pass? It's the transformation that takes place when a good idea becomes a concrete bill. Right now, the gun proposal with probably the best shot at going anywhere is the Fix Nix bill, which is an effort to try to strengthen the national background check system. The bill was introduced in response to the church shooting in Sutherland Springs, Texas last year, where, if you remember, the shooter, Devin Kelly, was an Air Force vet who'd been convicted in military court for physically attacking his wife and stepson. The Nick system should have stopped Kelly from buying guns, but it turned out the Air Force never reported Kelly's conviction to the Nick system in the first place, and later found out that it had missed dozens of other similar offenses. The Fix Nix bill tries to put an end to that problem, and it tackles it at both the federal and state level. It requires every federal agency to certify that it's submitted disqualifying records, like Kelly's, into the database. 
and to create an implementation plan. If an agency fails to meet those requirements, all of its political appointees can be denied bonus pay. It also reauthorizes two federal grant programs that help states report their criminal history records for four more years. Two weeks after another school shooting where the killer had raised all kinds of red flags, all of that seems to make obvious sense. The House did actually pass Fix Nix, but they passed it as part of a larger bill favored by House conservatives, the Concealed Carry Reciprocity Act. Just like it sounds, that bill allows anyone who's lawfully licensed to carry a concealed weapon in our home state to carry it in any other state where concealed carry is legal. It's a big priority for the NRA. They appear to have added Fix Nix to it as a sweetener to try to get it to pass in the Senate, where everything needs Democratic votes. But that's not going to happen. Senate Democrats will never go for the concealed carry part. And now some of them say that Fix Nix itself is too narrow, a half measure. I talked to Senator Richard Blumenthal, one of the co-sponsors of Fix Nix, about why this is all so maddeningly hard. Congress has been complicit. It bears a responsibility for the continued carnage. And the reason is, very bluntly and simply, the vice-like grip that the NRA and the gun lobby continue to have on the Congress. So part of the challenge for Fix Nix is the House passed version was combined with a concealed carry provision. And that's a non-starter I know in the Senate. Do you think there's any movement to take up sort of a standalone Fix Nix bill? And if so, what's the prospect for that in the House? Very simply, momentum and history are on our side. This country is absolutely aghast, astonished, appalled by 90 deaths a day, mass slaughter in our schools, churches, theaters. And I think that there are a growing number of my House colleagues on both sides of the aisle that want to do something. Fix Nix is a baby step. We need giant strides, but there is growing momentum for Fix Nix in the House. And I think if it passes here as a standalone, it will pass there. was approached by another student who demanded that he step left, step left if you know what's best for you. Richard simply replied no. The other student stabbed him in the chest and fled. On May 20th, 2017, Lieutenant Richard Collins III, a black student set to graduate from Bowie State University, was visiting friends at the University of Maryland when he was stabbed to death. The white student accused of killing him has been indicted on hate crime charges and is expected to stand trial in July. Now, the University of Maryland is looking to make an unusual hire to combat hate on campus. This is an unspeakable tragedy to happen on a campus. It must have been a topic of conversation all throughout the summer. Like, wh what did the school do when you got to campus? It just didn't feel like enough to me. There was one moment of silence and it felt like we were kind of shoving this under the carpet. The, the murder was the incident, but the issue was the fact that there's racial tension on our campus. Because we've always known that we were going to have to deal with race issues. That's just a part of being black. But like, now it's about safety. And like, I, a friend and I were walking down to the bus stop, um, and we had somebody just drive past us and yell the N-word out the window at us. And it's like, okay, like that's a race issue. And if the Lieutenant Collins incident haven't, hadn't happened, I might not have been so concerned about my safety. But in that moment, I was like, that man could have had a gun, that man could have had anything, and done anything to us just trying to walk to the bus. After the stabbing, the university scrambled to find the appropriate response. They held vigils, had a moment of silence, and offered counseling to students. But they also made an administrative change by adding funding to the Office of Diversity and Inclusion and put out a job posting for something called a hate bias response manager. Why does a university need a separate person to come in and adjudicate a hate crime for the university itself? Well, it's hate and bias incidents and potentially hate crimes. The reason that we need somebody to lead an interdisciplinary team of professionals to do this work 
is because higher education is being targeted by hate groups uh, coming onto college campuses and trying to disrupt, intimidate, and to provoke. What type of background is this person going to have? Because by the way you're describing it, it seems like they almost need a security background or you know, like a special ops background or something like that if it really is to prevent people from coming on campus. Right, so we're, we're looking for somebody who is a higher education professional, somebody with a wide array of skills and expertise in higher education to deal with issues of hate and bias. The announcement was met with skepticism from critics who believe college administrations have become bloated and overly bureaucratic, especially when it comes to social justice. The Office of Civil Rights or a Title IX coordinator or even people within your own Office of Diversity and Inclusion seemingly should be doing the job that the bias coordinator is doing. Like, why, why do you need another person in this, in this sort of role? This is not a new layer of bureaucracy. This is a new layer of expertise. And we're, we're trying to solve uh, some challenges on our campus and that exist across campuses in higher education. Some members of the college Republicans on campus were curious about the hiring of a hate bias response manager especially given the impact it may have on freedom of speech. I think we're very fortunate at UMD that we haven't had some of the incidents that other universities have had. If you look at Berkeley, if you look at some of the other schools that have actually descended into violence, physical violence, we haven't had that here at the university. We do have a good free speech culture on this campus. I've never felt afraid to voice conservative opinions. You know, we had a tragic event on this campus when a gentleman was murdered in a hate incident, and so we had to recover from that. Slowly but surely, we're getting there. We're having these great conversations. We encourage people to share their opinion, whether you're conservative, liberal, libertarian, anything in between. All the students we interviewed thought something should be done to prevent another hate crime, but nobody knew exactly what the hate bias response manager was supposed to do. Both, I think, in the dean's office and the Office of Inclusion and Diversity, you know, they, they told us about things they're doing. They're doing a symposium, they have a website set up, they have uh, different sorts of talks, and they started a task force. Were, were any of you aware of any of this stuff? They did mention the task force in the email where they notified everyone of Lieutenant Collins' death, that that was one of the steps they were taking <clears throat> to help, I guess, lessen the blow or, like, rectify the issue. and. Definitely there needs to be a cultural change, and I think it needs to come from the top down. You could hire 20 new administrators, and that doesn't mean the situation will be handled correctly. Not to say we're not doing anything, but we gotta do better. A German court delivered a major blow today to Chancellor Angela Merkel, the country's automakers, and the diesel technology both have championed for years. The ruling held that cities can ban the most heavily polluting diesel cars from their streets, and it will likely lead to driving bans in dozens of cities, including Germany's car capital, Stuttgart. The industrial city is home to car giants, Mercedes and Porsche, and for years, diesel-related air pollutants have exceeded legal limits there. That includes nitrogen dioxide, a major cause of respiratory disease. At a protest in Stuttgart last month, Vice News met the managing director of Environmental Action Germany, the small nonprofit that won today's lawsuit. Das Bundesemissionsschutzgesetz erlaubt ausdrücklich Verbote und Ausnahmen für den Verkehrsbereich. Jürgen Resch says that a court ruling was the only way to improve air quality in German cities, given the cozy relationship between car companies and politicians. Who is really governing? Who is the, the one who is deciding what is right and what is wrong? In the moment, industry is doing it. For the future, we hope that the parliament taking over again. Diesel technology is more fuel efficient than gasoline engines. And it became widespread in Europe in the 1990s, after German car makers lobbied to give buyers incentives in order to meet climate change goals. But the latest figures show less than 50% of all car buyers in the EU are choosing diesel. 
as companies including Volkswagen have been convicted of emissions cheating and criticized for exposing humans and monkeys to diesel exhaust during laboratory tests. Okay. Okay, good. The newest diesel cars are supposed to meet the highest emission standards. But many exceed legal limits when they're driven on the road rather than in a lab. Russia's group says this Opel failed when they tested it in Berlin. It's really very high concentration of pollutants. So it is more than 20 times above the limit. It's unbelievable. It was a problem of all manufacturers. So it's not just a problem of Volkswagen, not a problem of German manufacturers, but a problem of nearly all manufacturers. In a statement to Vice News, Opel said it couldn't immediately comment on the test, but emphasized the improvements it has made to the emissions of its diesel engines. Angela Merkel's government hasn't come down hard on automakers. Instead, her government has opted to reduce pollution through other measures, such as investing more money in public transportation. And today, Merkel tried to downplay the reach of the new court ruling. Was heute vielleicht nur wichtig ist, ist, es geht um einzelne Städte, in denen muss noch mehr gehandelt werden, aber es geht wirklich nicht um die gesamte Fläche und alle Autobesitzer in Deutschland. Chancellor Merkel tried to protect the car industry. This protection strategy was a wrong strategy. We have the loser in the car industry, we have the loser, the car buyer, the owner, in principle the voter. Everybody is on the loser side. Even as fashion has gotten faster, cheaper, and more disposable, there's another cost to stocking up on fresh looks. Fashion is now one of the most polluting industries in the world. The textile industry alone produces more greenhouse gas emissions than the aviation and shipping industries combined. And the sheer amount of clothes we consume, which already accounts for more than half of all the textiles produced, is expected to keep going up. From 62 million tons in 2015, to 102 million tons by 2030. At that rate, the fashion business would need to use 35% more land and 50% more water. There's this cute expression in China that you know the color and fashion next season by the color of the rivers in China. <laughs> Linda Greer with the Natural Resources Defense Council has studied the fashion industry in China for more than a decade. China makes more than half the world's clothing and textiles adding up to a $267 billion business there. But the government's tolerance for all the water the industry uses and all the waste it leaves behind is running out. China has gotten much more serious about its high polluting industries over the past several years. They have closed down a lot of factories. They have uh, really pressured a large number of companies and factories to upgrade their equipment, uh, become more energy efficient and less polluting, uh, use less toxic chemicals, etc. China is also tired of being a destination for textile recycling, another surprisingly big cause of pollution. This year, authorities banned the import of used fabrics and clothing, and that ban could make the global fashion industry even less environmentally friendly. China is the largest source right now, by far, of recycled fabrics and recycled fibers. If China bans all the source material, then they can't be producing the recycled yarns and fabrics and fibers. So we are working with the U.S. government and others to prevent China from fully implementing the, the policy. Beyond recycling, there's another idea that's catching on with some labels, the circular economy. Ellen MacArthur, who runs a foundation in the UK, has been pushing this solution. She believes the fashion industry needs a drastic redesign, so it doesn't even create waste in the first place. A vast majority of textiles that are produced end up um, you know, incinerated or burned. We lose about 500 billion US dollars worth of value every year because clothing is hardly worn. The majority of what is made is turned into a product, it gets used, and then at the end of its life it gets thrown away. Basically, if you design an economy where there's no waste, it has to be circular. It has to feed back into the system so the product would stay out there and used for as long as possible. It would then be designed so the materials can be recovered or someone else could use it, and then it would feed back into that economy as the raw materials. 
Brands including Stella McCartney, Nike, and H&M have already signed up to work on ways to implement the circular economy concept into their fashion lines. But for now, it's still way more likely that the clothes you love today will end up in the landfill the next time you clean out your closet. Is it my cup of tea? No. Everybody's looking for something. Looking for something. The Eurythmics was right. I mean, the original, right? Mm -hmm. the songs are made to be transformed, played, sung, whistled, hummed again and again through generations. A great tune and a, and a, and a great um, melody, uh, it's something you can really expand in any direction. The singer is very good. I like her voice. The arrangement is a bit emphatic and a bit uh, over the top for me. Beethoven can be over the top, but it's Beethoven. <laughs> Sometimes you need a melody, sometimes you don't. It's not a rule. There's no rule in, in film composing that I think uh, apply. Each movie is different and each aesthetic should be different. Some directors I've worked with would hate that the audience would leave the room, the theater, whistling a tune. It does capture some kind of a, an internal trauma, an internal anxiety, an internal um, panic. Yeah, it sounds very biblical. The Red Sea is opening, isn't it? No? Oh, somebody at the door. It sounds a bit cheesy, yes, at the choir and the court. Da, da, da. You know, all these songs you're playing to me are great. But for me, I wish we could play a string quartet. Because if you sit a kid here and, and have him listen to a string quartet, he might have tears in his eyes. But he doesn't know, because he's never heard a string quartet by Mozart or, or Schubert. Doesn't he have the right to listen to that? That's Vice News Tonight for Tuesday, February 27th.